The following presentation by Mr. Reed Edwards from Fox Pot Farm is part of a USDA NIFA SARE grant funded to Dr. Tom Terrell and Dr. Nikki Whitley at Fort Valley State University. Okay, so my presentation today, the main one, is growing and making high-quality Cerecia lespidiza hay that looks like pressed flowers and has most of the leaves attached to it. So what we go over is growing, fertilization, and making high quality less of these hay. So some of the qualities that we have, benefits, after we get it established, it's very drought tolerant, it's very pest resistant, it's a legume that I have never had to use an effect in the insecticide on, and most other legumes, that is something that you end up using fairly regularly because bugs like most of those grows well despite low pH. It will tolerate low to moderate fertility, which there are not many of our improved forage crops that are going to make high quality hay that that's the case for. It goes completely dormant in the winter. It will look like it's dead even when it's not. It is also fast drying, which is a good thing for missing rain showers and storms and that sort of thing because a good day to make hay is also a good day to get wet with an afternoon summer thunderstorm. So the challenges, it's the fact it is dormant in the winter, it provides some challenges, it uh, gives you some benefits as well. There are very few approved herbicides on here. Three CLSDs is a minor crop and typically doesn't make the list of the herbicide companies for when they are labeling new stuff. Leaf shatter, it's got a stem and leaf sort of configuration, and we want to keep the leaves on as we make a bale of hay. The leaves are where our nutritional value is. It's also where the majority of the condensed tannins are, which gives Cerise Lespides its unique properties compared to the other high quality hays that we have. And then we have fewer hay harvests compared to other hay crops. So fewer chances if you do happen to get one ruined by rain or that sort of thing, it will be a larger percentage of your yearly crop. So if you planted some uh, seed last year, you got a stand of AU Grazer Cerecia. So now what? One of the kind of old timers sayings about Cerecia Lespedeza is you don't want to fertilize it because you'll be fertilizing the weed. There are a lot of things about Cerecia that are that we do differently than other improved forage crops. This is one that I believe that should not be different. Now, it will tolerate low fertility, but it's not going to thrive in low fertility, and I'm looking to have a stand that thrives and makes very high quality hay. So we've got some answers on that. Dr. Chris Poich, who is the forage specialist at the University of Kentucky. He was previously at Virginia Tech. Did some research there on Cerecia looking at yields and fertilization. He sent me these slides. They looked at fertility on Cerecia. They went into some harvested pine ground and did some fertility studies. So this is where they were harvesting some of those and I think that's the non-fertilized one in the middle. And you can see it's pretty thin. So their initial soil test, the pH of 5.0, P, three parts per million, that'd be six pounds per acre, that's a very low number, and soil potassium, 47 ppm, which would come out at 94 pounds per acre. So the size of the plots harvested it two or three times a year, and they fertilized with, according to the soil test recommendations. Now those are probably outdated at this point, no one's really done work on that as far as I can tell, since probably before Dr. Machete's time of playing with it maybe even before World War II. So, but here, you know, an, a nice visual on no fertilizer and lime, and then what they got when they did fertilize that. This trial went, ran for five years. So basically what you've got on the different bars are the different years in the trial and the, the overall yield there from those plots. Statistically, all the no fertilizer ones would come out the same. The yes all came out essentially the same, even though there's you know, a lot of difference to the, to the graph, uh, to the size of the bars, but you see very large differences between fertilization and no fertilization. Their first year, year yield was 38 times higher when the lime, the P and the K was applied at seeding, and that was based on, you know, whatever the soil test values recommended. Over five years, collectively, there was seven and a half times the yield. So it shows that it will respond to the fertility you know, I think it opens a lot of questions and more work as to just what should that do, how, 
how valid are mm -hmm. the soil test numbers on an improved variety? Because I think we've seen with some of the other improved forage crops that with breeding and improved varieties that some of the older recommendations don't necessarily give you everything that you need to do. So it leaves lots of room for improvement, but that you do want to add lime and fertilization for, from the soil test recommendation. Now, the nice thing about Cerise is that it will survive and give you time to work on it because you may not be able to apply everything all at once. So it'll survive. The other stuff won't survive until you've gotten your soil improved significantly. So this will survive and will go. And so you can kind of work on it as you go along, but it definitely pays. You know, when you're looking at a seven or eight times, you know, 750% yield, that'll buy a lot of fertilizer. And we're looking at ideally five and a half to six and a half. It'll go certainly to 5 -0 and even, you know, to, to some lower numbers. Those will work fine, but yields will be improved significantly, and uh, forage quality, from my own personal experience, will increase significantly. I've come up with some kind of personal preference numbers. I kind of like to have about 75 pounds of P per acre, uh, 200 of K, calcium of 2,000. And I've noticed some very significant improvements in forage quality from that. So kind of a, a target or a goal, which certainly doesn't have to get there in the immediate future. So soil tests for your hay fields yearly. Addition of boron and moly as micronutrients. Uh, these would be sprayed on. They do fertilize and, and help the rhizobia, which are the bacteria living inside the plant, gathering the nitrogen from the air. And so those levels would be about four ounces of sodium molybdate per acre per year. That is of the, the chemical itself, one to two pounds of elemental boron per year, but you probably don't want to put more than a half a pound out at any point. So both of these work best as foliar fertilizers. So sprayed on in a liquid to get that small amount spread out over the acreage, and they work best going into the leaf of the plant. Gypsum can really help you to get the calcium numbers up and to promote root growth. It also gives you sulfur, which is necessary for legumes, and it's a sulfur source that does not lower pH, and it helps to tie up free aluminum, which aluminum burns the roots. Although Cerise is pretty uh, tolerant of it. Um, so for weed control, there are very few labeled herbicides, it's a minor crop, so it's not often included. There's a very good listing on the Wormex website, and this is Dr. Machete's page that used to be on his website when he was at Auburn and has some really good information there. Generally speaking, if it's an herbicide is labeled for alfalfa, it will work on Cerisia, and Cerisia will be more tolerant of it than the alfalfa will. But then, you know, so application rate, surfactant use, other nit additives such as nitrogen, which is typically on the label for things like post, pursuit, and select, can, can definitely make a difference in the effectiveness of those. So broadleaf weeds, some of the ones that I've had some significant challenges with over the years, horse nettle, pigweed, henbit, chickweed. Uh, the horse nettle is a perennial and it's particularly tough to deal with. Dotter, which is a yellow parasitic vine that is particularly tough to deal with because it will attach to the plant itself and not have a root system after it gets mature. And it sounds like if you have the ability to graze that, that sheep absolutely love it. It is a challenge to, to deal with from an herbicide standpoint. So Buterac 2,4-DB, is recommended for all legume seedlings on its label and probably the best broadleaf herbicide in the young stages of it that the Cerise will be the most tolerant of when it's young. And then Pursuit or Thunder, they're the same chemical thunders, the generic, one of the generic labels of that, the, the chemical is a mazasapir. The Thunder label does include Lespedeza on its label. And uh, Mature Cerise Lespedeza will tolerate a light dose of standard 2,4-D. There's a number of different concoctions or formulations of that. There's amine and ester versions, and there are stronger and weaker versions. Basically, you're looking at a half a pound of active ingredient per acre on that. For your standard run-of-the-mill 2,4-D amine, generic on the shelf, that usually translates to about a pint. 
So grassy weeds, we've got winter annual grasses such as ryegrass, small grains, that sort of thing. Summer annuals, crabgrass and signal grass, and then Bermuda grass, which is probably one of the most challenging ones uh, that's out there. I really like to do my best to get rid of Bermuda grass beforehand because I've never been successful at getting rid of it in a stand of three. On the, on the grass side of things, in the wintertime, Roundup will work when it's dormant, and you can still use the or poster select and poster select over the top of it once things are up and growing. So how do, what do you do in the wintertime? We've got a field out there. It goes dormant after a hard frost, about 28 degrees or so. Then the leaves are going to fall off, and it'll look dead and barren until springtime. So I've been using a cool season cover crop, and that would be great, particularly if you're going to use it as a pasture, because then you would have some winter grazing. For me, it keeps the other winter volunteer annual weeds from coming in and gives them some competition, but your timing and your method of termination are going to be critical because you don't want, in a hayfield situation, trash going into your hay. So there was a, a section that didn't get a cover crop, so you can kind of see the Lespedeza stems right there. You see some of the green coming up, henbit and chickweed. This was in a field that got a cover crop, and that was just in a little spot where I missed with the, with the no-till drill. So winter annual cover crop, in this case, this was from a year ago. The first picture was taken early in November with a cover crop that was put in in the 1st of October. And then the second picture, when it had been grazed off after frost and then going back through the winter. So the first picture on the left, the, the grass that's in there is oats, a black oat, Cossack black oat. You see the daikon radish leaves there. There is crimson clover in there, it's a little bit harder to see. Like right there, you can see the, the cerecia. And then that's actually, I, I tried throwing some sun hemp in there, which of course is a warm leaf plant, but it was going in early enough that I could, thought I might could get a little bit of growth there. And sun hemp is also another legume that harbors the same strain of rhizobia that cerecia does. So I was trying to give another plant to kind of help the, the colony of, of Rhizobia along there. That was kind of my, my thought there. So then the second picture, it was grazed off. I was grazing it, one, to, to knock back the cover crop just a little bit and also to let my horses eat the leaves off of the cerise before they fell off after after the frost. And so, so then typically, how do I get rid of my cover crop? Because you don't want trash going into your hay. You don't want it shading out your cerise when your cerise comes up. So typically I will graze it off prior to spraying it. And then it depends on the weather that you have. If it's before the cerise has come out of the ground, then you can use Roundup and that'll take care of everything. If the cerise has come up, then you're kind of stuck with a, a two application deal, one to get the grass and then one to get the broadleaf. So, you know, the chemicals that I mentioned here earlier, so the, the pursuit Flash Thunder or 2,4-DB or the light dose of 2,4-D to get the broad leaves and select or post to get the grasses. And then in the conversation with Don Ball a month or so ago, another option potentially would be chromoxone, which would burn the tops off of everything and take the annuals out by the desiccation. It would also, if your lespedes has come up, it would top it, but then it's going to come right back. What were you grazing with? Uh, I was grazing with horses. Okay. So... Uh, and they cleaned it up pretty good? They do clean it up pretty nice. Yeah. So can we put horses out now to clean up the annual grasses and stuff that are coming up? Sure. Sheep and goats would be fine as well, right? They would. Yeah. Once it comes up, they'll eat it as well as eating everything else. Right. So, But now would be a great time before everything has really come up, you know, to, to let them knock that back. Then it'll be easier to identify what's just kind of there and tall and, you know, half dead or dying versus the stuff that's actively growing. So <laughs> when do we harvest it? Once it grows in. So Cerecia only flowers once a year. So alfalfa flowering is one of your triggers to as to when to make hay. Flowering has nothing to do with Cerecia and making hay because it only flowers in the fall and produces seed that one time. Forage quality is going to be very much influenced by the maturity of the plant, and it will get large, it will get woody, and it will also grow back slower if you let it get too big. So it equates to the height of the stand, 18 to 24 inches gives you nice fine stems, 
lots and lots mm -hmm. of leaves and very high forage quality. Cerecia, once it gets to that height, is going to grow like crazy. So when you cut it or when you start in the spring, it's going to start out slow. You're going to wonder if it's ever going to grow and ever going to get there. And But it's kind of like a locomotive building up ahead of steam. And once it finally gets there, it will fly. And so when it's there, you think, oh, a few days I might need to, to cut this. You better go ahead and hook the mower up right then because all of a sudden it's going to be going. 18 to 24 inches has worked very well for me. You know, kind of depends on the thickness of the weather and what your target is. You know, how, how high quality is, are you looking for a little more volume and then, you know, the weather that you've got to, do you have the time to get it put up well. A nice field of three seal Lespedeza. So it's a warm season legume. And so when when's your first cutting going to be? That's going to be highly influenced by the weather that you have in the spring. When does it warm up and when's your last frost? So when does it come out of the ground and really get its chance to grow? My first cutting has been anywhere from the last day of April to the middle of June. My earliest second cutting has been the third week of June. So one year when we had a cold spring, my first cutting was almost as late as the second cutting on another year. So it's slow to put leaves back on and, and regrow. A higher cutting height will help the regrowth. If you leave some leaves on the stem, it will grow back from those points and those little that little baby stem that has a trifoliate leaf will turn into a branch and then you'll have four or five stems. One of the things and one of the conservation uses of Ceresia is that when you let it grow up and canopy and get waist high, it will shed its lower leaves and give you a leaf cover and organic matter into the ground. When that happens, you have bare stem at the bottom, and if you mow it at that point, it's got to come back from the crown, you know, from the ground, and that will take you two weeks longer to make a, your next crop of hay. So four, five, even six inches, if you can, for, to me, the you know the little bit that you're losing in that hay harvest to leaving it on the plant is going to more than pay off and we'll make your next round a thicker, heavier harvest because now you'll have four stems on this one plant instead of growing up another single stem. So the last two weeks before harvest, it grows very, very fast. I typically think when I look at it two weeks away, the field looks like I'm a month away. Come back a week later, so you've gained a week, now you're a week away from cutting. It looks like it's now two weeks away from cutting. And then you go about two or three more days and it's, man, I've got to get my equipment hooked up because then it just really, really takes off. A little close-up shot there. What's the goal? Harvesting leaves. So with any forage crop, these are where the nutritional value is. So just from a normal animal performance and weight gain and milk production and all of that, Leaves are where the nutritional value is. Bermuda grass, fescue, oats, alfalfa, Ceresia lespedeza, that's where your nutritional value is. We also have the condensed tannins at play in Ceresia lespedeza, and they are also concentrated in the leaf more so than the stem. So we want to keep the leaves on the plant, but we've got to get the stem dry to make a good bale of hay. And that's going to be the same in any forage as well. Leaves dry very quickly, our stems dry slowly. How do we get the stem dry while keeping the leaf on the plant? Now, Cerise has got an advantage here and that the stems are pretty dry even when you've got a green plant growing out in the field. That's why it dries quicker than the other forages, but we've got the same challenges. We've got to keep the leaf on the plant while putting a dry stem in the bale. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to use humidity to help me do that and I'll actually over dry the curing Ceresia and then rehydrate it with humidity. I've got my portable high growth thermometer sitting on the table over there if anybody would like to look at that. That does not tell you anything about the moisture content in your hay. There are handheld things like that that you can stick into the windrow, you can mount them on your baler, but that's not what this is. All it tells you is the humidity in the air and I will sit that in the windrow, or not next to the windrow on the morning when I'm going to be bailing, and there's a correlation that I will get into here in just a second. There's a reference there, Collins and Moore. I got this out of a paper that Dr. Ed Rayburn at the University of West Virginia had on handling hay. And so it's the correlation of relative humidity to the moisture in a dried forage. So for this to work, you're your hay can't be just a little green and it needs to dry a little bit more this morning before I bale it. 
it has to be completely dry the afternoon before. And when it absorbs the moisture with the 150% humidity that we often have in the morning, it absorbs it fairly evenly. And what works at my farm is when it gets down to 60% humidity on the meter, then I'm going to have a 16% moisture content in my bale, and I'm going to keep my leaves on. And so then, you know, one of the, I was talking with one of the seed dealers recently, and she said, and I said something about my Theresia hay, and she said, whoa, whoa, whoa. She said, that's not hay. She said, those are pressed flowers. Uh, so there's a picture of the thermohygrometer. So there is both a, there's a temperature component of that. That's why there are a couple of different lines on there. So temperature does play into that. That's also shifted things for me for the most part that I'm usually bailing in the morning. So usually somewhere some between 9 and 11 o'clock in the morning is when I am starting my bailing process, which is not what most folks are doing. Most folks are bailing in the afternoon. But with Cerise Lespedes, if you're bailing at 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, chances are you're leaving all your leaves in the field. So the leaf and the stem will dry at different rates. Once our hay is drying at equilibrium, humidity is going to determine the final moisture content. And then it's like a sponge and it's going to absorb moisture back out of the air. And so 60% relative humidity in the field at my farm is going to give me a 16% moisture content. So I'm going to check it the afternoon before, make sure that it's completely dry. The first time you do it, you'll think you have messed up incredibly. Leaves will be, you know, if you touch it, the leaves are going to fall off. The stems are going to snap and crack. But that has worked very, very well for me. Now, on a side note there, I also grow alfalfa hay. I'm typically bailing my alfalfa in the evening with the evening humidity, which for me does not last nearly as long. I typically have like a 45-minute window in the evening where I usually have about two hours in the morning. But the alfalfa does better with a quick soak in the higher humidity before you bale it, and it will absorb a lot more moisture than the Cerise will. Cerise does better with the long soak overnight than trying to do it in the evening. So I'm going to mow after my after the dew is off the plants, so typically, you know, sometime mid to late morning. I'm, I head mine immediately so that I can spread that out so that as much of it sees the sunlight as possible and accelerates the drying process as quickly as I can. I typically am going to rake into windrows early in the morning, and I will do that even with dew still physically on, you know, droplets of water still standing on the plant there. And then I'm going to check the hay in the afternoon, you know, somewhere 3, 4, 5 o'clock, and at that point it should be too dry and stems popping, leaves crackling and falling off. And then the next day I will start when the humidity gets to 60% out there in the field. So I kind of laid out my tentative schedule, what I think about that I'm going to do, because it is very different from the spring harvest to the midsummer to the fall. So there's three harvests that I typically get. Usually the first one is somewhere in May, 4th of July, ballpark for the second, and Labor Day for the third. Now last year, from one week of spring harvest to the next, I went from the very first time I added a day to my spring schedule, and the next week I was into my summer schedule as far as how I handled the hay. So there's always adjustments with the weather that you happen to have at the moment. Is it cool and cloudy? Is it extra hot and dry? So typically in May, and I, I put days on here just, you know, to kind of throw the, the relativity of the, the week in there. So if we've got a clear forecast and it's time to cut, on Monday morning, I'll mow the Cerise with the disc mower once the dew is off of it. And I typically take the other tractor to the field first with the tether. So I'll go out with the tether, park it then go with the mower, and as soon as I'm done mowing, I don't take that tractor back to the barn. I just park it right there, and I hop on the other tractor, and I, I head it before it has time to dry. It does dry really quickly, so I want to get it flipped over before and scattered before the leaves have time to dry and start coming off. So typically in the spring, it's still not real hot. The days are not quite as long yet, so I usually there. Tuesday, I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to let it sit out there and dry. Wednesday morning, I'll be raking that in the early morning into windrows. So that afternoon I'll be checking that, and at that point it needs to be overly dry and dry all the way through the windrow even to the bottom. And then on Thursday, then I'll be out there with the thermohygrometer and start bailing 
when we get to 60%. Now, the first time I was able to put this theory into play, it absolutely terrified me. And I had tried it a couple times before when I made the transition to being full-time on the farm. And when you're working with time off of work, you kind of do it when you can or when you can arrange to have the time off. So I was never able to fully put the theory into play. But then I was full-time on the farm. I was there the whole time. I could be there when I needed to. And then that May, we had incredibly low humidity the first week of May. And I started the very first time that I did this, I started bailing at 7 o'clock in the morning the first week of May. And I was utterly terrified. But it was also the prettiest less of hay that I had ever made at that point. Again, I'm going to check a few bales, make sure that they feel right, the stuff going in looks good, and, and then I'm going to run just as fast as my baler will gobble it up. So I'm typically doing about 10 acres at a time. I've usually got about a two-hour window between too wet and too dry. In that two hours, I can usually do somewhere in that neighborhood. And so usually I'm starting at 60, and I'm going to quit at 40% if I'm not done. Now, you know, then again, it's a judgment call. If you've got two, two windrows left to, to do, I'm going to finish the field up. If I had, you know, equipment issues and something slowed me down and I've still got half the field to go, a couple hundred bales to go, then I'm going to stop and I'll either come back that evening when I get back up above 60%. But it's usually 60 to 40. Below 40, the front end of the baler is going to start to look like a confetti machine. And so typically then the best thing to do is to stop and wait for your humidity to come back up. Typically the next morning, I'm usually running, I start at 60, you know, so your humidity is up at 100% to start with. So when it comes down to 60s where I'm going to start bailing, you know, the guy in Texas that I learned this technique from, he would start at 65 in his climate there in East Texas. So, you know, somewhere in the 65 to 55 ballpark is probably going to be where you're going to want to be. But if I'm starting, if I'm trying to bail Ceresia in the evening, I'm usually letting it get up to 70 or 75 because at 60, that's 60 but coming from dry, yeah, and yeah. so it's still kind of dry at 60. Okay. So it's usually I don't start till it's getting to 70. The problem at my farm is that it usually goes from 70 to 90 in half an hour. But then again, farmer that I've been assisting mm -hmm. last year, his comes up to 70 and then it goes up to about 80 and it sits there all night. Mm -hmm. So we bail all night at his place. And now it scared me last year when he was talking about doing some on a time when I was tied up with mine, and I said, you know, I said I, everything we've done at your farm is an exception to what I do at my farm. So, like, it scares me to turn you loose and say, yeah. go and do this, when it's kind of scared me every time I've done it at your place anyway, because we've done something that's outside of my experience. So, it's to get the humidity in that range, and so that might be in the evening at your farm, you know, depending on, on where the different people live here. You know, I think it's it's pretty much a given that since we're all in the South that it's going to be high humidity is, is one of the traits that we have. But when and how it gets high will be different at everybody's place. So in July, typically that's the quickest harvest that I have. And so my schedule will be something like this. In this case, I'm going to wait till afternoon so that I don't get too much drying done the first day. So usually at early afternoon, so somewhere 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so noon to 2 o'clock, I will start mowing. So I'll mow with the disc mower and then ted that immediately afterward. Tuesday morning, I will rake that into windrows early in the morning. Late that afternoon, I'll check the hay. Again, it should be over dry and dry all the way through the windrow. And then on Wednesday morning, we'll start bailing when we get to 60%. Fall harvest, so that's usually somewhere about the first week of September. It's a little bit longer than the summer, but shorter than the spring. Monday morning, I would mow the Ceresia with the disc mower as soon as the dew dries, so we're going to back to the early morning. This one will be kind of a, a two full day schedule. Again, Ted, Tuesday morning, rake it into windrows, and afternoon, check the hay, and then start bailing when you get to 60%. And so that's just a guideline for kind of what works for me, and it always changes based on the weather that you have at the moment. But what we're after is our green leafy bales of Cerisia lespidiza, very fine stems. was conversing with somebody the last couple of days. Cerisia lespidiza has a much finer stem than alfalfa does. If, you're, if you have, so if you put a bale of a, a sample of nice Cerisia next to a sample of nice alfalfa, 
your alfalfa stems will be very large compared to the cerise. If you have cerise stems that are the size of a nice alfalfa stem, you're going to have problems because the cerise stem is firm and we could say woody. The alfalfa has soft stems, so they can be big without being problematic, but we want very small stems, and that's one of the advantages that AU Grazer Cerisia Lespedeza, it is a very fine stemmed variety of Cerisia, and one of the advantages it has over just common Cerisia. When we have the fine stems, you're not going to have anything left behind, and if you keep the leaves on there, you're not going to have anything left behind. You'll have very high forage quality. Older literature states that Cerisia lespedeza will be equivalent to Bermuda grass. And really the best thing about Bermuda grass is the volume that we can make. It's never really, really high quality forage. It's not going to give you enough energy to handle dairy or milking mothers, that sort of thing. So, But we can do much, much better. And I have been able to really push the alfalfa growers on the forage quality to push, you know, and then to have equivalent or better on my Cerisia as some really nice alfalfa. And then we've got the health benefits of Cerisia, but those condensed tannins are in the leaf primarily, and so we want to feed our animals leaves. So you want to take a forage test. Now, lots of things are different. None of the answers are easy with Cerisia lespedeza and forage testing, which is Pretty standard, regardless of whether you're doing something like Bermuda grass or alfalfa, it's different with Cerisia. But I take a core sample out of every field, every cutting, so that's a core sample out of at least 10 bales of every lot of hay. Here's the different part. You only want to use a wet chemical analysis. So when it comes to forage tests, you've got instrumental NIRS analysis and you have wet chemical. Wet chemical is the older standard and it's kind of an a la carte sort of menu. It's going to be 5 or $10 for every analysis that you want done because they're going to weigh out a different beaker and a different sample to run. With the instrumental, it's how many packages that they're putting, and so it's kind of more like the packages on cars now that you have an interior package and you get windows and stereo and leather seats and all that for one price. But 3CL Espediza is not in the databases at this point since they've done that. No one's running the animal performance test to see how well they're doing on given hay. And the condensed tannins look kind of like things like lignin and some of those cell wall structures, which are typically negatives in the forage quality side of things. And so this looks like that, even though it's not that, and it shows up deceptively low. So what I'm liking for a forage test at this point, and it came from when I discovered how NIRS didn't work when I split some samples, sent them to the UGA lab, and had huge drastic differences on the same sample with the different methods of analysis. But the UGA Feed and Environmental Water Lab, there is three tests, F10, F12, and F13. That's going to run just under $50 a pop. Uh, it's like $47, I think, for the combination of those three tests. And so here, this is a UGA analysis, this is those three tests, and so you're getting crude protein, ADF, NDF, and TDN, so the total digestible nutrients, and a lot of the forage stuff is going to the, the one number overall qualities, kind of the more basic of those is TDN, and then we have RFV and RFQ, and I don't think RFV and RFQ give a good estimation at this point of what Cerisia is. But this was one of the ones from last year, and total digestible nutrients, you know, 70%, 70.6%, which is way, way up there on the forage quality side of things. And so then, you know, kind of in, in summary, you know, a field that was, that, and that picture was taken right before cutting. And so, you know, what that can look like when you've got a nice, nice pure stand and, a, and thick density. And, and that was actually, when we were talking about, you know, what does your field look like now? or as it's growing in and was it looking a little sketchy at the end of last year, I was extremely disappointed. That was the first year field last year, and I was very disappointed in March and April with how it was looking like, and I was considered buying some extra seed to put out or torching it and starting over, and I actually had the best year I've ever had on a first year field. Your harvesting equipment, these bales are heavy when they're done right. Okay. So, you know, sure is nice not to have to go picking square bales up. And, you know, since we're typically dealing with small ruminants, whether it's 
people are growing this to feed their own animals or whether you're growing it for sale, the primary market there is sheep and goats. And there's a lot more of a market and preference for small square bales rather than large rounds. And so it's definitely nice to not have to be chasing 70 pound bales around the field and loading them onto a trailer. So I'm going, over, this is a, my easy trail bale basket that I've used for the past 10 or 15 years. I've actually acquired a New Holland stack wagon, so I'm going to be selling those, but that has been a good, good system. And typically most of my hay does leave the day that I make it. And so those bales were actually, you can see my barn in the background. So if I have to store hay, that's where it's going. That's 150 yards away. Usually what I'll do is when I have the orders and people are coming, it'll get dumped right there in the yard at the house so there's more room to pull trailers in. It's just a jumbled stack, but when all you have to do is pick the hay up and set it on somebody's trailer and they tell you how many they want on there, it's a pretty minimal amount of labor there. And then nice green leafy hay and then there's some of that, you know, sitting around here, but we want lots and lots of leaves on there. Uh, and there is an intact square bale sitting right outside for anybody who wants to pick it up, kind of see what the the weight is, but they're nice, you know, nice, tight, heavy, 60, 70 pound bales. There is kind of a feel, you know, if you bale it too wet, it'll be heavy and may, might be heavier, but there's a spring, a springy feeling to a heavy bale that's baled right compared to a heavy bale that is baled wet. Um, it's a heavy, a bale that's heavy and wet, it's kind of got a dull thud if you drop it. It's like a lead weight, and it's it's like a heavy but springy, bouncy ball. That that bale of hay will actually bounce a little bit if you drop it. But, yeah. So then marketing, um, you got a kind of a weird forage and a minority source of livestock. So how do you manage to define them? There's typically not the Cattlemen's Association that's there. You know, it's still a little more segregated between dairy goats and meat goats and hare and meat sheep and, you know, and then you've got the camelids that go into that. And and there's not quite as much in, in and there's, mm -hmm. you know, the separation that goes along with that segregation to the different types. So it's not like you can just kind of hit the whole thing with one, one broad stroke. So something that's been very successful for me is when local extension offices or livestock groups have a small ruminant workshop, which a lot of times comes along with, you know, FAMACHA or parasite training, that sort of thing, but, you know, sometimes other, other overall themes. But you usually get, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 40 people at those things, and when they see how green and leafy the hay is, and, and so I've taken 10 bales along to things like that, give away as door prizes, and you usually sell plenty of hay to cover it up. And I mean, it's a significant, if you think about a $15 bale of hay, I'm giving $150 away every time, but you usually come away with enough orders to, to make up for that. Facebook and Craigslist, I've just recently jumped in on that, and it's got a very wide audience. It's also, you know, something of a headache and, and comes with its own set of cautions, but certainly is a way to reach a lot of people there, and there are a lot of sheep and goat clubs or discussion groups or that sort of thing. State Market Bulletin, the one in South Carolina does not seem to be a good outlet for it, but a friend of mine who grew a little bit of annual Espedes the last year had an ad in the Georgia Market Bulletin, and he was getting calls. And I think he basically, you know, one person, it was a small slot that he had. He only had 50 or 60 bales. The first person bought it all, and then he started sending all the other calls that he had, you know, from that. So, and then sale barns, and particularly if it's a, you know, a focused sheep or goat session in a sale, and shows, 4-H, FFA clubs and meetings. I haven't gone into these last three, but it's certainly things to, to look at and depending on your local market as to for something that, that might potentially be an avenue. Because with any of this stuff, if you have a barn full of hay and it's time to make your next hay cutting, where do you put it? Well, is it a, is that a resource that you have or is it a liability? It can be either. If you can't get, manage to get rid of it, then eventually you run out of space and, you know, it, the same terminology of folks being horse poor or sheep poor or goat poor or cow poor, if it's a tough market for it and you can't manage to get rid of it and turn it into some money, then it's more of a liability than it is a benefit. So. And that's all I had for, for this talk. And so there's my contact information. I live up in Lawrence, South Carolina.
and reedy at foxbyfarm.com is my email. And you said something about brown melons, the solution? Mm hmm Do you sell a lot of brown bales? I have yeah. never made a round bale in my life. Okay. I have never run a round baler in my life. So I do all of mine in square bales. A lot of times, you know, there there are a lot of the sheep and goat folks, the small rodent folks who, you know, have fairly small acres, you know, five acres or something like that. So they're going to be feeding by hand, and they're not talking right. about hundreds of animals. They're right. talking about tens of animals. So in that case, square bales definitely work better. So there's nothing wrong with the round bale, and it certainly, if you're feeding your own, would make a lot of sense. Western large hay markets, they're typically selling their hay by the ton. So it doesn't matter, large, small, heavy, light, you pay for, for weight. But I'm getting somewhere between $450 and $500 a ton for my cerecia. So these bales are tighter. They pack better than grass hay. So if you have a good, high-quality round baler, you could have a 4 by 5 bale that would weigh 1,000 pounds easily. And that's a half a ton. So how much should that, now, we'll discount it a little bit for being in the large package, but you're still talking a $200 round bale. Mm -hmm. What's your market gonna be for a $200 round bale? Reed, how many bales per acre do you typically average? It's usually about four or four and a half tons a year. Seems like it's somewhere in the 40 to 50 bales an acre per cutting. These are, yeah, 70 pound small squares, 14 by 18. So I'm trying to make them right at a 36 inch bale because then they, if you stack them in a crisscross mm -hmm. pattern, they stack well. Typically the first cutting will be the smallest and usually the middle cutting is the largest. But last year, you know, we, we were talking earlier with some of the challenges with weather from the different folks and we kind of had a wildly varying summer weather pattern last year. I actually had probably my best hay year ever. And usually the last cutting is definitely smaller than the second, but last year I was at 150% of my mid-year cutting, but I got six and a half inches of rain the first 27 days of August. Hmm. And so the reason, you know, there have been a couple times I thought I might get a fourth cutting with, you know, getting the first cutting in early, but what usually happens is somewhere in mid to late July and then August, it's both hot and dry. So last year I had six and a quarter or six and a half inches of rain in August and hot. And so if you throw both the heat and the moisture to Cerecia lespedeza, it'll flat out grow. Doc, I have one question for you too. Based on your research, this stuff is a little bit hotter than uh, just like stay Bermuda grass hay. What what kind of recommended feeding rates for sheep have you are y'all looking at? I mean, you can't just throw it out there free choice. I assume you have to regulate how much they eat. I mean, it's not hot really. You can use as little as what twenty five percent for parasite control as over the total diet. But we have put out free choice, re some of Reed's hay out free choice, and 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 let them have it as far as in pen studies even to look at parasite control and actually in that study they grew better than our other growers hay and bermuda grass cerisa lespedeza because of the tannins make it make it less of a problem right it doesn't blow and some of the others so and, and typically you know i think of alfalfa being 20 to 25 percent protein cerisa being 14 to 20 and, I, I, you know, I, I top that, you know, sometimes I've had 21, 22, but it's not quite as high in protein. But, yes, I don't think you have to worry about that. You, you, The main reason you want to regulate intake would be the cost. But you do <laughs> want to get enough into them for them to have the parasite control, which, you know, at 25% or so. Of the total diet. And if you estimate as fed, they're going to eat, what, 6% of their body weight as fed, 4% dry matter. I guess it depends on the yeah. matter of the feed. So, so overfeeding and developing scours, things like that, it's not an issue. No. No, and that was less but easier. No, it actually dries out their poop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it actually reduces the incidence of scours. Like I said, the, the biggest problem with free choice is the cost if you're buying it. Okay.